Let's welcome Ms. Kimberly Bryant. Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight we're going to talk about coding. Um, I know it's a favorite subject for many people, but let's just dive right in with our um, objectives. Um, so we have a disclosure statement here, and I'm going to go ahead and read this. In compliance with the American Academy of Family Physicians guidelines, I hereby declare I do not have financial or other relationships with the manufacturers of any commercial services discussed in this educational activity. Okay, objectives. So tonight we're going to get a basic understanding of the background and organization and purpose of ICN-ICM and Hicks Picks, and we're going to review a few basic coding rules and then we're going to talk about medical necessity requirements and then we'll just talk briefly about CMS transmittals and change requests and then at the end we're going to um, talk a little bit about ICD-10 and what ICD-10 is going to bring to our industry. So what is ICD-9-CM? Basically, ICD-9-CM is the code set that we use to assign a numeric code to our diagnoses and procedures. And we use these codes for reporting and tracking and trending. Um, ICD-9, um, uh, the acronym stands for International Classification of Diseases, and it was originally created by the World Health Organization in the 1900s, and um, back then it was used to track um, mortality. And over time, it, um, we began to track mortality and morbidity. Um, and in the United States, we use ICD-9-CM um, to help with our um, our payment system, um, as you know, it's required on our claims. And uh, ICD-9 is updated every year in October, and any changes and updates to the codes that are released in the Federal Register each year. So some characteristics of ICD-9. Um, there are three volumes to ICD-9-CM. Volumes 1 and 2 include the alphabetic and tabular index for diagnoses, and then volume 3 includes the alphabetic and tabular index for procedure codes. Now, the procedure codes in ICD-9 you may not be very familiar with because those are used for inpatient uh, facility coding. And I wanted, as on this slide, I just wanted to show you how um, decimal placement is very important um, because it can change the meaning of the code. Um, diagnosis codes have four or five digits, and then procedure codes have um, three or four digits. So if you are having to write the code on, let's say, a physician's order or something, just be sure to write all the digits and put the decimals in the right place. I know that seems... Um, Unimportant, but it, it can it can make a difference in what code is being assigned to that patient's claim. So this slide just shows some of the chapters that are in the um, the ICD-9 book. As you can see, um, it's uh, split up by body systems and um, conditions. And then at the end, we have our injury and poisoning codes, and then we have V codes, and we have E codes, which are like our environmental causes, like motor vehicle accident or something like that. And as I mentioned um, previously, the procedure index and tabular is in volume three of ICD-9. Um, and it's set up pretty much the same way as the diagnoses are. It has an alphabetic index and a tabular index. And with both um, the diagnoses and procedures, um, you, you take the term that you're looking for, let's say pain, the patient has abdominal pain, and you'll look up pain in um, the alphabetic index, and then you would scroll down and look for abdomen, and then you would find a number, and then you would cross-reference that number in the tabular index. So it's always important to not 
code just from the alphabetic index. You always have to go and check it in the tabular index because the tabular index may have some other um, instructions um, for that code, like add a fifth digit or this particular co code excludes some type of condition. In order to help us assign appropriate codes, we have official coding guidelines that are um, updated each year by CMS and the National Center for Health Statistics. Um, and it's, it's got the, this includes guidelines in addition to the instructions that are listed, listed in the IC9 book. So it get, tells things like, how do you determine what a principal diagnosis is or how do you determine which additional codes to select or um, what does not otherwise specified mean or um, if you have an acute and a chronic condition um, do you code both or um, which one do you code first the acute condition or the chronic condition so there's lots of um, <laughs> instructions on how to select the appropriate diagnosis code and procedure code. Um, in addition to the official coding guidelines, we also have um, Coding Clinic, which is published by the American Hospital Association. Um, the um, Coding Clinic is a, an entity where coders or, or anyone can submit questions to the AHA um, about a specific scenario um, and how to code that specific scenario. So, once they receive the question, um, they will have their team of coders um, review the information and um, they, they may even send the question on to their editorial advisory board where they have a group um, of people, um, physicians, um, representatives from CMS, the AMA, and, um, and people who work in the industry and they collaborate over the answer and then once that information is published in the coding clinic, it becomes official coding guidance. So coders have access to the co official coding guidelines as well as the coding clinic. And coding clinic is similar to CPT assistant if you're more familiar with that. So um, just a couple of um, coding guidelines. Always code to the highest degree of specificity. If the code requires five digits, always code the fifth digit. If it only requires four digits, always code the fourth digit. Um, because if, let's say, you're sending um, a patient to have some type of test, maybe an x-ray of some sort, and you are writing the, di the diagnosis code on the order form, and um, you, you you know it's abdominal pain, but you write, you're not sure what the code is, but you know it's 789.0. Well, 789.0 would be considered an invalid code because the, the fifth digit is missing. So we would have to get a, an updated order in that, in that scenario, but that's just an example. So always code to the highest degree of specificity. And then um, assign the appropriate code for the sign or symptom that is the reason um, um, for the admission as the admitting diagnosis. So if if the patient is coming to see you because they're having pain, I'm, I'm probably going to use abdominal pain as my, my go-to <laughs> easy um, example. Um, but if they come to see you or if they go to the ED and for abdominal pain, that's what the admitting diagnosis will be. Um, just a couple of other co um, diagnosis coding um, guidelines. When you're um, entering those codes, let's say on the claim, the, of course, principal diagnosis goes first, and then your secondary tertiary diagnosis will follow, and your principal diagnosis is you know, just the main reason the patient is being seen. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, principal diagnosis in a second. And then you also want to code any other uh, coexisting um, conditions that the patient may have um, that the patient's currently being treated for. Let's say um, the patient has diabetes and they're currently on insulin or they have um, CHF and they're, 
taking Lasix or something. So you always want to code any coexisting conditions that the patient's being treated for, even if that's not the reason that the patient um, is being seen. Now, if the patient has something that's not being treated, it's not necessary to code that condition. Um, there are V codes that are available if you want to note that the patient has a, a history of some type of disease or if you want to indicate that the patient has, let's say, a family history of cancer or they themselves have a history of cancer but they don't have the disease and you want to note um, um, that they, they've had that condition. Um, and as I said before, um, we're going to talk about principal diagnosis again. So here is the formal definition of a principal diagnosis, diagnosis in the inpatient setting. And it's that condition established after study to be chiefly responsible for occasioning the admission of the patient to the hospital for care. So I'm going to go back to my really um, simplified example, um, if a patient comes in and they have abdominal pain and um, you work them up, you're doing lab tests and you order a CT of the abdomen and you're doing uh, various workups on the patient, exams, etc. And after your study, after your review of the patient, you determine that the patient has um, um, gastroenteritis. Um, then your principal diagnosis would be gastroenteritis and your admitting diagnosis would be abdominal pain. Pretty simple. Now in the outpatient setting, um, you're not going to, um, the patient wouldn't have necessarily as much as a, a workup as they would in an inpatient setting perhaps. Um, let's say the patient's just coming strictly for a CT of the abdomen and when um, you or, when you ordered that test, the patient had abdominal pain, but you wanted to send them to a freestanding radiology center or something um, to have an, a scan. And uh, after they had the scan, um, you found that they had an abdominal aortic aneurysm or something like that, then that would be your principal diagnosis. But if there were no findings in that in the outpatient setting, um, then that principal diagnosis would remain abdominal pain. Um, now moving on to HIXPIX, which is what m many of you may be more familiar with. Um, HIXPIX is the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System, and we have Level 1 and Level 2 HIXPIX codes. And Level 1 is the one that you're most familiar with, um, which would be your CPT codes. And then we also have Level 2 HIXPIX codes, and that would be like drugs and prosthetics and orthotics. Um, CPT codes have five um, digits and it's all numeric and uh, remember in ICD-9 our um, diagnosis code can also be all numeric and have five digits but it has a decimal so it could be easily if both were written on a piece of paper it could be easily um, confused so it's always important like I said previously to include your decimal so in CPT there's no decimal it's just five digits and it's numeric and it's um, maintained by the American Medical Association um, and it identifies um, different services and procedures um, performed by physicians and other um, clinical profession professionals and includes your E&M codes, your uh, surgical procedures, your radiology um, tests, your CT scans, your labs, and um, in the medicine, the medicine section would include codes like um, outpatient behavioral health or um, drug administration codes or things of that nature. And these are the six, um, the six um, major uh, sections of CPT. Now this slide is just a snapshot of a page from um, a CPT book and I just wanted to point out that it's very uh, important to, to know how to read the codes. Um, if you notice um, 93304 is indented here and um, 
basically um, it, and then you look at 9330 you have to go back up to the previous code so 93304 includes all of the information up to the semicolon and then the information that it has listed next to the code so 93303 is trans thoracic echocardiography um, for congenital anomalies complete. And then 93304 is the same thing, trans thoracic echocardiography for congenital cardiac anomalies follow up or limited study. So when you're selecting um, CPT codes, if if you have to do that in your setting, um, it's important to know what um, what you're actually selecting. So just a few of the important con conventions in CPT. Um, Add-on codes, there are many add-on codes in CPT, and basically an add-on code cannot be reported um, by itself. It must, also, must always be reported with the primary um, procedure. Add-on codes are identified in the CPT manual with a, a plus sign in front of it. And if a claim is submitted with the add-on code only, it's going to be denied. So always be mindful that you need to select the primary um, procedure um, with the add-on code for it to be meaningful. Um, modifiers, uh, I know many of you are familiar with um, modifiers and they just basically alter the definition of the um, um, Alter, excuse me, alter the circumstances of the procedure. Doesn't change the definition of the CPT code itself. Um, for example, um, if we have, let's say, we have a um, a fracture repair, um, if we add a a 50 modifier to that CPT code, that would mean that we performed that um, um, fracture repair on two limbs, so bilaterally. So 50 modifier means it was performed bilaterally. And then you're probably very familiar with um, the modifier 25, which you would uh, append to an e m code if you have um, um, a separately identifiable e m code performed with a procedure. And then we also have unlisted um, procedure codes in CPT, and we don't like to use unlisted procedure codes, but sometimes there's just no way around it, and generally we use that for um, um, procedures that don't have a, a CPT code assignment yet, and that would be maybe for some type of new technology um, that's um, emerged, um, then we would have to use a unlisted CPT code and uh, also with unlisted codes we have to provide um, an operative report or supporting medical record documentation um, for those codes. Um, and this slide just shows some of the symbols that you'll see in your CPT book and remember I talked about the add-on codes, it's a plus sign, and then a, a, a field and circles of new codes. So that's just informational. And here are some of the commonly used um, modifiers that you may have seen in your practice. Modifier 25, which I mentioned previously, modifier 50, which I mentioned, and modifier um, 52. Let's say you had um, a, or you performed um, some type of, let's say, a um, a colonoscopy or something like that and you you were able to almost complete it but you weren't able to get all the way through the colon or something like that then it was a reduced service it, what service it wasn't the full CPT code but and there was no other CPT that matched what was performed um, repeat clinical lab test means that um, duplicate lab tests were performed on the same day we also have um, uh, level two modifiers, which will uh, identify specific body parts, like which finger was fractured or which toe was fractured or which coronary artery um, 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 
was included in a bypass or uh, and which side of the right and left, which side of the body the procedure was performed on. Let's say the right femur had the fracture repair. Um, and then here are some other modifiers that you'll, you will see specifically in the physician world. Um, prolonged E&M service, professional component, um, meaning you only did the professional, not the technical, um, multiple procedures, uh, a procedure was discontinued, um, two surgeons, assistant surgeons. So um, it, in your CPT manual, um, depending on um, which version of the manual you get. If you open the front, the front left side of your manual will have all of the um, modifiers listed. And then in the back of your CPT manual, um, a detailed description of how to use those modifiers will be um, listed. Um, just briefly about Hicks Fix Level 2 codes. Um, those are also alphanumeric codes um, and they're five digits and these are maintained by CMS instead of the um, AMA and they used to, uh, used to identify um, like I mentioned uh, supplies, prosthetics, orthotics um, and basically used for billing purposes. And here are some of the categories, um, J codes, which are our drugs. Um, for These are used for the drugs, drugs that are being infused, not the administration of the drug, but the drug itself. Um, we also have G codes. There are also dental procedure codes, which aren't um, covered um, by um, CMS, but they are available for whatever payer um, may recognize those codes. And then here are just some of the other categories, prosthetics, orthotics, the Q codes, which are the temporary codes, um, vision and hearing services. And these are just some commonly reported Hicks Picks codes that you may um, have seen, like JL 885 is for um, a pro for Procrit, and then GL 257 um, is when um, uh, unscheduled or emergent dialysis is performed in a, a non ESRD certified facility. Or colorectal screenings, color excuse me, colorectal cancer screening. So these are just some commonly reported Hicks Picks level two codes. Um, um, CCI edits are very important to mention, um, and that these are our Medicare National Correct Coding uh, initi initiative um, edits, and basically they help to uh, help us to avoid improper code um, pairing. Um, hold on, let me just catch my notes up with the slides. So basically, um, it, with NCCI edits, um, we'll have column one and column two um, codes and uh, when we have those together they will edit on a claim and we have there's also a modifier listed on on the list let me just go to the next slide there's um, it will either have a zero one or a nine and a one means that if those two code codes are, are reported together, um, an appropriate modifier can be used. If it has a zero next to the code pair, it means that no modifier um, can be used um, to, for those co two codes to be reported together. And I'll give you um, an example. Um, if, a, let's say, a patient comes into the ED and they have a Foley calf and they also have um, an infusion of an, an antibiotic or something, um, the, the code for the Foley calf and the code for the drug administration will edit out because there's a CC. I edit for those two codes to be reported together. However, um, an appropriate modifier will allow um, 
those two to pass. So, so you will apply, apply, excuse me, apply the modifier to the column two code. Now, if you have the edit and you don't make a correction um, and apply an appropriate modifier, CMS will bundle the codes and payment will be based only on the column one code. So it's very important to address any edits or denials that you may get um, because of CCI edits. And just an example of where um, a modifier wouldn't um, be appropriate. Um, let's say that we the patient came in they had a Foley cath and we coded two different Foley procedures let's say if um, CPT 51700 and 51702 um, 51702 is the more comprehensive of those two and um, it really wouldn't make it doesn't make sense to report both of those together so even if we applied a modifier to the to one of those codes, it would it still would still be appropriate to report those two CPTs together. So we need to be mindful of our CCI edits. We also have um, MUEs, um, medically unlikely edits, meaning that um, um, certain codes shouldn't have more than a certain number of units. Um, reported. So if we t took a look at the MUE list, and I'll just pick a random procedure like a hysterectomy. It'll have an MUE of one because you should only have one um, hysterectomy. Um, but there's also um, MUEs for different lab lab tests. Like there, there may be a max of four type four um, um, labs on one day of some sort. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get an example of one of those, but there are medically unlikely edits and if you have more than the um, the indicated number it will be denied so it's important to be aware of MUEs as well medical necessity um, kind of switching gears here um, and medical necessity just simply means that Medicare is only going to pay for those procedures and services which they consider to be reasonable and necessary. Um, and you as a physician may not agree with what Medicare has um, said is reasonable and necessary, but this is what they're saying um, they would pay for on certain procedures. So they've defined this um, in their national coverage determinations and their local coverage determinations um, that they have for certain services and procedures not every procedure in CPT or every um, um, inpatient procedure has an NCD or, or an LCD so there's a select number so there are many where this won't necessarily um, apply but they um, do re re recommend that all services are reasonable and necessary but there are some that they've just um, defined more specifically so um, like I mentioned it's a test or a test or service is considered medically necessary by Medicare if a diagnosis sign or symptom from the LCD or NCD specific to that procedure is provided when ordered. So how do we know um, what those diagnosis signs or symptoms are? So we would look in our NCD or in our LCD. Now the LCDs are going to be um, developed by the MAC in your area. I'm in the state of Georgia so um, my MAC is Cahaba. So Cahaba has a list of LCDs um, that I can go to their website and review. There are many um, Macs across the, across the country. Uh, Trailblazer is one, Highmark is one. So check to see what your, your MAC is and review the LCDs. And then um, the NCD you can find on the CMS website in their National Coverage Determinations Manual, um, and it's very easy um, to very easy to find. And you can go through that to see if there are any services that you may provide that may have an N an NCD uh, associated with it. 
and I just wanted to mention about the um, Max. They they were recently developed, and as a matter of fact, in Georgia, we just switched to our Mac in 2009. Um, prior to the Mac, um, we had um, FIs and carriers, so you may be more familiar with the term um, carrier. And basically, the Mac is um, the entity that processes our claims. So, Cahaba processes Part A and Part B claims. So they uh, process hospital and they process um, professional claims and by putting um, um, putting basically putting the FI and the carrier services in one place it just promoted more consistency um, of claim processing um, before the um, the FI had a group of LCDs and then and the carriers had a group of LCDs and they wouldn't always match which would cause a problem sometimes when a patient was coming from their physician um, for, um, with an order for a procedure that was checked by the um, according to the carrier's LCD and it didn't meet medical necessity according to the um, how, according to the FI so it just caused a lot of work on the back end so it's become more st streamlined since we've sh switched to the max so medical necessity generally medical necessity would be checked in the office um, when you're writing the um, or order for the test or service you want to check to make sure that that test that that procedure is covered and then it may be checked by um, the coding department um, once the patient come gets to wherever they're having the test performed um, that registration staff may check medical necessity that's how we do it in in our system um, when the patient gets to registration for a scan or lab um, um, uh, medical necessity is checked at that time and if the diagnosis that's been provided does not meet we will request an updated um, diagnosis from um, the physician or an updated order from the physician or ask the patient to sign an ABN which we'll talk about um, next. So what's an ABN? It's an advanced beneficiary notice and it basically gives patients advanced notice, notice that the test of service that um, has been ordered for them may not be covered based on the diagnosis that's been um, given. And um, two modifiers apply to ABNs and these modifiers would be appended to um, the CPT code for the procedure and the, the GA modifier would be used if um, we've checked the LCD and the diagnosis that's been provided by the physician isn't listed and then the GX modifier is really a voluntary means really means that a voluntary ABN has been signed and that's for procedures that we know are either excluded from the Medicare program or there's simply no Medicare benefit for that test or service so um, that would be for maybe like for plastic procedures or they're having some type of bariatric um, sur surgery that might not be covered um, by Medicare. It is inappropriate to have a patient sign an ABN after the test or service has been provided. Um, at that point the um, provider is liable and um, the pa patient cannot be charged for the service. However, if the patient signs the ABN, they may um, they, they um, are saying that they would, will accept financial responsibility for that test if Medicare doesn't cover it. So um, just briefly, a valid physician's order should have the date the order was written. Um, it should have the exam or procedure that's being ordered by the physician. It should include the diagnosis, the reason for the, the test or service, and it should include the physician's signature and date. And the diagnosis listed on that order is what we will use to check for medical necessity. And please, no stamp signatures. Um, CMS does not allow um, stamped signatures. Now, 
as you all know, um, the rules constantly change with CMS, and the way they communicate those changes is uh, uh, changes are with uh, transmittals and change requests. And I would encourage you to. Um, Take a look at the CMS website to see which list serves are relevant to you and your practice, and sign up for those list serves so that you uh, only get those uh, only get the information that you need because you, it can be overwhelming because there's there are changes almost daily. Um, now, any changes to a national coverage determination or something like that would be communicated in a change re, in a change request. And changes um, for LCDs, the local coverage determinations, which come from your MAC, um, will come. You would have to sign up on their listservs um, um, directly from their um, website. And here is just a snapshot of what you would see on the CMS website. This is just um, a list of the manuals that are out there. So there's tons of information, and I would encourage you to take a look at Publication 100-3, which is the National Coverage Determination Manual. Um, it has a lot of a good information um, to review there. And this is just an excerpt of what the National Coverage Determination Manual um, might look like for a, a, a particular test or service. This is for percutaneous transluminal angioplasty. And it gives a description of the procedure they're talking about. And then it tells you what the nationally covered indications are for that, te for that test or service. And it goes into um, detail and then it'll go on to say what the nationally non-covered indications are and if you notice there's no um, diagnosis codes listed here however with the local coverage determinations you'll find di um, diagnosis codes to help and I also want to just talk real briefly about the OIG the Office of Inspector General, um, I work in compliance um, at work, so it's this is so important. I, I know many probably don't have a, an auditing function in their practice, but just for your own protection, know be aware of what the OIG is looking at, and there the OIG is in place to protect the beneficiaries of Medicare and Medicaid, and so every year they publish. Um, the the audits and investigations that they're going to be focusing on um, and it's published every year it's called the OIG work plan and you can take a look at the um, oh go, just go to the OIG website and I think I included that at the, end of, at the end of the presentation and they have it separated by what they're looking for for Medicare versus Medicaid what they're looking for for in for from physicians, what they're looking for from hospitals. So take a look at that so that you can assess your own risks and make, make sure you're not um, doing anything that would cause an investigation by the OIG. And so the next couple of slides just gives you an idea of the types of things the OIG might um, be um, looking at like billing for services or items that weren't provided, um, providing medically unnecessary services, upcoding, um, or outpatient services rendered in connection with inpatient stays, duplicate billing, false cost reports, that's probably more um, facility based, um, unbundling. Um, Patients freedom of choice, um, hospital incentives, um, the anti-kickback statute, joint ventures, patient dumb. There's just a, a, a list of things that they they might look at. So just go to the OIG website, take a look at the work plan, and see what they're focusing on. And then um, if not you, maybe your office manager or um, someone can begin to perform audits to see if there's any risk um, in, in your practice. Now on to ICD-10, um, which is something new that's going to impact all of 
all of us and it's going to impact us very soon um in the 2009 federal register um in the final rule, it was published that we would be transitioning to ICD-10 um, on October 1st of 2013. And since it's been published in the in the Federal Register, that means that that's a, a hard date. So um, on October 2nd, 2013, we will no longer be able to use ICD-9. So we, it's really time to begin preparing for ICD-10-CM. Um, so ICD-10 has been you know, in development since the 1990s and has already been implemented by the World Health World Health Organization and several other countries have already implemented ICD-10 and um, <clears throat> the United States um, is finally um, getting on board and switching to um, the new this new code set and it's going to be a major change as you'll be able to see in the next couple of slides but ICD-10 CM is going to replace volume 1 and 2 of ICD-9 so it's only this part of IC10 is only going to replace the diagnosis portion and then ICD-10 PCS will replace volume 3 of ICD-9 CM which is the which are the um, procedure codes that as I mentioned earlier will only be used in um, inpatient hospital settings so that probably won't be relevant to to many of you um, so why are we changing to um, ICD-10 and leaving ICD-9? Basically, ICD-9 is outdated. It's been around for 30, 30 plus years, and it's, um, it's pretty much reached its capacity. And there's not much. There's no more room for for growth. And ICD-10 is going to allow for that room for growth. It's going to allow for greater a greater degree of specificity in in a code. We're going to have an increased number of codes. We'll have more clinical detail in our on our claim. So within one code that's listed on the cl uh, claim, we'll have a lot more information than we than we've had previously. So we're hoping that we'll have a reduction in the number of rejected claims. And we won't have to send in as many attached medical records with claims. Um, ICD-10 will allow a better reflection of current medical knowledge and accommodate for um, um, uh, advances in medicine. We'll have uh, an increased ability to compare with international data. As I mentioned, several other countries are already using um, IC, IC-10, including Canada, Australia, Germany, Belgium, France, um, United Kingdom. So several other countries are already re reporting with um, ICD-10. Um, ICD-9 is no longer supported by the World Health Organization, um, and we'll have a, an increased ability to uh, tr track public health outbreaks and bioterrorism. So here, um, this is going. This is showing some major differences between ICD-9 CM and ICD-10 CM. The diagnosis portion. We're going from about 13,000 codes to approximately 120,000 codes. Um, it's a huge increase. Um, we're going from a mostly numeric code to an all alphanumeric code. Um, currently, IC9 um, codes have 3 to 5 characters, and IC10 will have up to 7 characters. So I have listed here what diabetes looks like in IC9. It's 250.00. In IC10, it look, it's going to be E11.9. So it looks very different from IC9. So I'm afraid to tell you that all of your little coding cheat sheets or job aids that you may be using will have to be updated with new codes um, and then the guidelines will be updated accordingly. The process that you use to find a code will be very similar to IC9 um, so I, I, I don't think the transition will be 
terribly hard. I think there'll be a learning curve, but I think coders will catch on pretty quickly and people who are used to um, looking up codes will catch on pretty quickly. Um, and this is just another comparison. I don't know that you can see very well on this slide, but this on the left side, these are codes for benign prosthetic hypertrophy. Um, and we have two codes available in ICD-9. And then in, in ICD-10, we have one about five codes that would um, they offer, they offer greater detail um, than the two that we have available in ICD-9. Um, now the major differences with PCS, um, we're going from three to four characters to seven characters. Um, the co the ICD-10 PCS is totally different from ICD-9. Um, as you can see, tracheostomy in ICD-9 is 31.1 and in ICD-10 PCS is 0B110F5. Um, and this seven digit code, each one of those characters has a different meaning. meaning. So it's going to, it's a, t a totally different process than the old way of coding um, ICD-9 procedures. And um, here's a sample um, tabular entry from ICD-10 PCS. And as you can see, um, each the each of those characters has a different meaning. The first one is for the section. The uh, second one is for the body system. The third is for the root operation. Fourth, body part. Eighth, approach. Um, fifth, excuse me. Fifth is approach, and then sixth is device, and then seventh is the qualifier. So we need a great deal of information in an operative report or procedure report to uh, code the uh, ICD-9 procedure. So our documentation um, has to reflect the um, the detail we need to assign the the appropriate code. It's important to document as uh, as much as you know about that uh, about the patient, so that the appropriate diagnosis or procedure code can be um, applied. So, who needs to know about ICD-10? Just about everybody who's using the code. So, I would encourage you to. Consider all of your work pre processes that use ICD-9 codes and work from there. And um, so coders, clinicians, you as the clinician need to know about ICD-10, auditors, um, your, um, and ancillary departments that's more geared towards facilities, but um, your information systems. Um, you need to speak with your vendor, your vendors. Um, who's doing your billing service? Are they ready for ICD-10? Um, and 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 from there, you determine what your needs are. Tra what kind of training will you need? Um, do you need to update all of your super your super bills? Um, I know there are many consulting companies out there that are doing readiness assessments for ICD-10, but I would encourage you to go to the CMS website um, in the ICD-10 section, and they have some great tools out there where you can do your own um, your own assessment, especially if you're in a small a small practice. Um, and I think that's it, and I'm ready for questions, Serena. And I hope you all enjoy my talk. Okay. Okay. What's the difference between a professional and technical component of a procedure? So if um, let's I'm going to use an easy easy example. Um, let's say you perform the patient had an EKG. If you if all you do is read the um, interpretation um, of the EKG, that's just a professional. But if you actually perform the um, the EKG, that's the technical portion. So the technical is actually performing the procedure, and then the professional would be just uh, interpreting the results. Um, let's see. I'm Andrea. I work in a rural clinic at
can't view the rule. You need an ICD code to get a nocturnal pulse oximetry screen. So, Andrea, do you you need? Are you saying you need the code? You can't find the code. Do you not? You don't have a code book. I'm not sure I understand your question. So, Andrea, if you could um, give me a little bit more information. I think I missed one question. Oh, you can't find a code that Medicare will accept to cover for um, the procedure, I'm assuming. Hmm. That's a good one. Um, I may have to do a little research for you on that one, but if it's, if, if it's not covered... Um, The patient may have to sign an ABN, um, but I can let me do a little bit of research on the on the on that on that question for you. Sabrina, can I get a copy of these? Yes, um, they'll be recorded in the room, but I can okay. copy and paste them and email them to you. And okay. Andrea, could you please send in your email address? I won't show it to everyone, but I'll write it down because okay. it comes into the queue. And that way I'll have it on file so that we can get back with you. Okay. Did you see, um, Kim, did you okay. see there was another? From Jonathan. Oh, let me, okay, let me see. Oh, Jonathan, your second question, what about electronic signatures that generate? Those are, okay, it's only stamped signatures aren't um, appropriate, but the electronic ones that are generated in the EMR, those are okay. And your, um, um, the MAC in your region should have um, detailed information about um, signature requirements. Um, so it should give you more de more detail for your area. Any more questions? Okay, okay. Um, I do have that email, so I'm putting it. I'm writing it down. Okay. Um, I did have a question when it comes to, um, you know, the ICD-10. I'm assuming that as we all go to EMRs, that these new systems that we're getting, they're already going to be pre-wired, um, if you will, or ICD-10 will already be loaded in the new EHR systems because we're all going to have to go to EHR anyway. Um, so is that going to, or are we going to have to get an upgrade? I mean... You, you really need to check with your, check with your vendor, vendor to make sure they are ready. ready. I, I wouldn't I, assume. I wouldn't assume. Wow. Okay. They should be. I, you know, I think most are, um, but I would not assume. And can you also, um, I've been a clinician for about 14 years, and the only time I've ever had a coding class is when I worked in private practice and I was in a specialty, that our doc had someone actually come in and do kind of like a, almost like an in-service, I won't even call it a class. So the only time I've had some in-depth coding was if I decided to take a course. Are there um, places that you can recommend or organizations that, you know, just in case the providers out there are finding themselves in the same way that you kind of have to fend for yourself, if you will, any organizations that they should look for if they want to look for a course, particularly with the ICD-10 changes and, you know, just to kind of help us get our feet wet and get rid of some of the anxiety. Because like I told you, those of us who've been practicing a long time, we know these codes like the back of our hands. And to think of you changing, you know, otitis media to something else just makes me a little nervous, you know. Yeah, no more 382.9. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or the um, URI 465, you know, so. Right, yeah. Um, I would definitely, um, CMS has a, a dedicated section on ICD-10, which has a good um, 
um, presentation and overview and a lot of different um, links. They even have links um, for uh, small small provide, pr provider groups um, with information geared towards the small group. I would go to, so I would go to it's CMS dot HHS slash ICD-10. Um, I would also go to the AHIMA website, A-H-I-M-A dot org, and they have a lot of information on ICD-10, and they may also have, they also have um, online ICD-10 training. And um, AHIMA is the um, um, organization for health information management and so anyone that's a facility coder is generally certified through AHIMA. Um, um, there's also the AAPC and I'm not a hundred percent what their website is but I would imagine it's AAPC.org or something like that but that's the American Academy of Professional Coders and um, they may also have um, online classes for ICD-10. Um, but definitely AHIMA and AAPC if you're looking for coding classes. I would steer away from um, the, the, the things you see on TV, the medical coding and billing type programs that say that you get a certification. I would steer away from from those, but definitely AHIMA and AAPC, they are, they are the recognized um, uh, entities that certify coders in, in in the industry. So if not, I mean, you don't have to want to be a coder, but I'm sure they have coding classes that are appro appropriate. And then also, um, the uh, physician specialty organizations may also have um, coding education information as well. Can you repeat the first one, the CMS.HHS? It, um, and I may be seeing, I think I have it on the slide. It's actually, this is it, Sabrina. CMS.gov slash slash ICD-10. And to the audience, um, I have placed some um, resources on the web, in the website, and it will be um, in the general primary care area under um, tools and templates and then there's another one called websites I place some of these things there but the ones she's given us now then I'll put them out there tomorrow so they'll be available with a little bit of a description and links and you just go to primary care for all and then be able to go to the resource section click on the links and it should take you right there from Sarah um, she said it takes her forever to um, get her super reels coded correctly. Any tips for speeding up the process? Now, and I'm go assuming um, that you mean your E and M code, Sarah. And let me know if I'm if I'm incorrect. Um, but there are temp templates out there to help you select your E and M level um, pretty quickly. And I can. Um, I know we have we have like some little cards that we use within our s system that I might be able to share. Um, so if that's what you're talking about now, as far as looking up diagnosis codes, there's really no quick way to do that other, other than you know keeping a list of your frequently used um, um, codes. But if you don't have um, coding software, it's going to take a little bit of time to use the book. Um, so let me know if you're talking about your your E and M code and and oh here she got oh okay yeah I, I, it, it's there's no fast way there's no fast way to do it I, I'm, I apologize unless you know if you had an electronic record it would be faster but um yeah I, I don't think there's an easier way unless you had a template to help you arrive at your ENM code a little bit faster um, and, ke and kept a list of your commonly used ICD-9 codes that that may help yes when I worked particularly in the community health center um, what I did was I ended up just writing them out on a piece of paper and actually laminating it and I just kept the card in my pocket um, 
and you know just my most frequent ones that's what I did until I practiced for a little while and then I could I memorized some of them so you know the the real common ones then you know and then the other ones you just may have to look up but you're right if you're trying to see the patient get them out the door and they have to have the super bill to check out it can be very Mm-hmm. And I know on um, those, um, I think on those, on the AHEMA and perhaps the AAPC website or maybe even your um, specialty um, website, they may have the cards that you can order with commonly used diagnoses as well. Are you familiar with those cards, Sabrina, the one, ones that are specific yes. for different specialties? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And from time to time, when I definitely when I did OBGYN, we did have some we can just pull out and then some of the places where I've worked they also will kind of um, the way they designed the super bill is that they would put a lot of the codes at the bottom and you mm-hmm. could just actually circle uh, the mm-hmm. one that you wanted now that could get kind of crazy a little bit because your circles too big when you're rushing but um, mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, to our audience, if there's no, if there are no more questions, I just want to say thanks so much for you guys participating, and um, particularly ans- ans- asking questions because it really helped to add to our discussion. To our expert, Miss Kim Bryant tonight, thank you so much for this presentation. It was very, very informative. I know you were a little nervous and you thought that it <laughs> may not be good for us since you're in a hospital setting, but um, I thought it was great information and we'll get the audience to weigh in on that. There'll be a, um, a CE quiz that'll be popping up momentarily. So if you guys could just put something in the comment section about what you thought and how, um, you know, if it was relevant to you. I want to say thanks to um, Qualen, who's our IT and our e-learning specialist. Um, I cannot do this without you, Q, so thanks so much. These Primary Care for All webinar series is made possible through a partnership between the National Center for Primary Care and Clinical Directors Network. Direct financial support for this webinar series was made possible through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. As I mentioned earlier, the presentation was recorded and it will be on the Primary Care for All site in the On Demand section. Please also note the upcoming events. Tomorrow we have a primary care coffee shop entitled Common and Not So Common Herbal and Home Remedies. So please come out and join us tomorrow night at 8.30. Um, Also too, if you would like to have CE credit, please complete complete the quiz in its entirety and if if there are um, no other things then thanks everyone and have a great night